Okay, we've reached the end of the respiratory viruses. This last video is about the coronaviruses, and this is the video that I have to remake every term as we learn more about COVID. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, the coronaviruses we knew before 2019, and then lots about COVID. So let's get into that. So um, one that we don't talk about as much is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and this is a very serious disease um, with a high fatality rate, um, but it has been well contained. It has not spread very far, and so a relatively small number of people have gotten this disease. Um, what I will say is that uh, doctors who've treated these people noticed a lot of things that we are now seeing with um, with COVID, such as long-term neurological and cognitive um, issues. But the sample sizes were so small, they couldn't really put numbers on them. And recent studies have come out where we can now really assess the risk um, people have after after getting better from COVID. Um, what's perhaps more relevant to our discussion is SARS. So this is a closer related, uh, closely related virus, um, again, from the Coronaviridae family. It has all the same broad characteristics in the virion as, um, as MERS did, or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, but SARS is better known because it did cause a pandemic, technically, um, in 2003, it spread to many countries. The difference was uh, it was contained. There was a massive public health response to this, um, and ultimately it stopped. And there were a handful of cases in the U.S. Um, and Canada, um, and then it stopped. And it hasn't been seen in the wild since. It did seem very contagious, partly because of a super spreader event in a hospital. Um, so. There was a, a famous case with um, uh, lots of people in a hotel got it, and lots of people working on um, the respiratory care um, ward got it. Nurses died, and um, people were very freaked out, wondering just how bad it would get if it became a very common infection. But it was limited to 8,000 known cases. Um, so it never reached the level COVID has. And there are very good reasons for that that I will explain um, in a little bit. So um, a lot of the people who got sick were healthcare workers. And again, that's because when people are sick, they're shedding a lot of the virus um, and it's spread through droplets, just like COVID or similar to COVID. Um, and so people who are in close proximity to each other can, can get it. Um, and in the case of SARS, people would, were most likely to spread it when they had the most severe um, signs and symptoms. So um, when they were hospitalized is when they would be shedding largest um, amounts of the virus. And again, there was a big public health uh, response, and that took the form of things like um, taking people's temperatures. Because asymptomatic infections were rare, Right there's not any, any evidence of like fifty percent asymptomatic like we have with with uh, with COVID. So with SARS, doing things like taking people's temperatures as they entered buildings was a very good, very effective precaution. And so airlines set up temperature monitoring stations, and they wouldn't let anyone with a fever get on a plane, and that greatly slowed down the spread of SARS. Um, and because of that, when, if somebody had a fever, public health people could quarantine them and figure out where they had gone and do contact tracing um, and ultimately warn all of the people they'd been in contact with. And they've tried to do that with COVID. Um, they, they tried to do that with COVID uh, in 2020 um, in hopes that it would work. And for various reasons, it was never going to work. Um, so what SARS caused was acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, and that is a severe pneumonia um, with 
extreme difficulty breathing, so extreme respiratory distress, basically. And um, that's what people would have if they had to be hospitalized. And so that that was very uh, notable. And that's why it was causing panic among, amongst healthcare workers. They saw how serious it was and how easy it was for healthcare workers to catch it. And so at the time, um, there were photos being spread of people in uh, Hong Kong wearing masks. And Americans had never seen this before. They'd never seen healthy people wearing masks before. And so that alone was enough to scare people. Um, and I used to put a picture of that in my lectures about SARS um, to show people the precautions people might take for a droplet spread um, disease like that. Uh, but now you all know what masks look like. We've all seen lots of people wearing masks, so there's no point in putting a photo of someone in a mask in um, this lecture. So um, there's no treatment for SARS, no direct treatment, and no vaccine, although I will say the reason we were able to get COVID vaccines so quickly is because people spent a decade developing a SARS vaccines. And the, the, uh, the technology of messenger RNA based, um, well, messenger RNA in uh, nano droplets, that became very mature technology because they were working very hard um, to make SARS vaccine. But since SARS never reappeared, the vaccine never went into production. It just was a lucky thing um, that it was very easy for several different companies to make um, COVID vaccines using exactly the same technology that they developed for SARS. And so that brings us to COVID-19, and that is the disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. And there are a lot of different ways of writing these. This is what I've seen uh, the microbiologists using. The CDC puts a dash between the V and the 2. Um, in our, case, in our uh, context, it just doesn't matter that much. So COVID-19 has a lot of different possible presentations and symptoms. Um, patients go through a lot of different things when they get uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the, the virus, SARS-CoV-2, is a worthy adversary of humanity. It does amazing, terrible things that don't haven't gotten a lot of press. So when we think about um, the signs and symptoms of, of COVID-19, a lot of these would be familiar to you, like the uh, loss of smell or taste, um, shortness of breath, the dry cough people used to talk about. Um, but if you look at the whole list of this, there are a lot of strange things like, like diarrhea, um, muscle aches, headache, where is that all coming from? And we will see that can all be explained by um, its tissue tropism. This virus binds to the ACE2 protein on cell surfaces, um, attaches via that, and then is able to enter the cell. Um, it's enveloped, so it can do um, it can do the endocytosis or just fuse with the membrane. Um, and so by this point in the U.S., um, so I'm speaking in May 2021, there have been 30 million cases, um, 30 million positive tested cases in the U.S. Roughly 600,000 people have died, and the real numbers are probably higher than this um, of cases, maybe not of deaths. In the U.S., we do a pretty good job of recording causes of death, so it's not likely that a lot of people died of COVID without knowing it. That's not the case in other countries. So we're hearing right now in India, for example, no one knows how many people are dying of COVID because there is resistance to writing COVID as a cause of death. Um, but in the U.S., what we do know is that there are likely to be a lot more cases, um, actual infections, than there are known cases, just because um, we have limits to testing. So there's that. Um, and something like 40% of cases are asymptomatic, so people wouldn't get tested in the first place. But also people with mild cases might never get tested. So there are likely a lot more cases um, than what we, what we know. 
Um, so I'm going to go through different studies and show you different things about COVID as a disease um, that you should know. When I'm walking you through individual studies, uh, I'll show you a lot of numbers, but you definitely don't have to memorize the numbers. I'm not going to test you on numbers. Um, I'm not going to test you on individual symptoms. Uh, I want you to get what I'm saying about these things and get the conclusions from each slide. That's the main thing. So first, how does COVID-19 work? What does the virus do? It does a lot of things. It interferes with the immune system. It dysregulates inflammation. And again, it uses the ACE2 protein to attach. So, well, what does that mean? We can look at what cells in a human have the ACE2 protein. For example, epithelial cells in the lung have the ACE2 protein. So lungs get infected and we see damage to lungs. Enterocytes get infected and we see diarrhea. Endothelial cells that line arterial blood vessels and arterial smooth muscle cells have the ACE2 protein. So in severe cases, we see COVID spreading along blood vessels. And this explains how it can get into any organ. And in some cases, um, there is good evidence that it's getting into the brain. Um, also, um, various different uh, variants to different degrees infect um, epithelial cells, um, nasal and pharyngeal epithelial cells. And you can imagine that if those cells are being infected um, and they become little virus factories, well, then the little, little virions they release are in the nose and the throat, and they're going to be released by coughing. So the, the more um, contagious variants um, focus more on infecting nasal and um, pharyngeal cells. So let's look at prevention and treatment of COVID. So prevention, we have two major ways to prevent COVID. One is the social distancing that has been so disruptive over the past um, whatever year and more. And so that it's mask wearing, closing certain businesses, um, not being in crowded indoor spaces. Um, anything that can prevent uh, inhalation of respiratory droplets, so anything that can prevent you from inhaling somebody else's respiratory droplets is an effective way to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, but that requires social distancing, right? That requires certain businesses to be closed and it requires people to wear masks. Um, and what we've wanted all along are vaccines that can give people immunity so that we can reopen businesses um, and stop wearing masks. And so we have three uh, vaccines and we're lucky because um, these are manufactured here and the US has first dibs on these vaccines. And so a large fraction of people in the US um, are vaccinated. But as I'm speaking in May 2021, 40% of adults in the U.S. are vaccinated. Um, and that's not enough to stop COVID from spreading, but that's enough to protect tens of millions of people who won't need to go to the hospital. Um, that's a big deal. And other countries, most other countries have 1% or 2% vaccination um, just because they haven't gotten the vaccines yet in sufficient numbers. Um, so in, in other countries, as, as people in the US um, are starting to relax, people in other countries are having to start new lockdowns and um, consider new social distancing. And they'll be doing that for months, where in the US with our high vaccination rates, we can slowly reopen. So. These vaccines are a huge win for the, for the U.S. and any other country that can get them. Um, in terms of treatment, there are two sorts of direct treatments for COVID-19 now. One of them is remdesivir. This is, a, this is a nucleotide analog. So basically, it looks like a nucleotide that would be used to make RNA. And when the, the virus goes, uses its RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make its genome or transcribe its genome, so to speak, that's what virologists say. They say transcribe its genome because it's making RNA, because it's an RNA virus. 
when it goes to transcribe its genome, it incorporates this fake um, nucleotide and that ends the transcription where it started. So it makes short RNA molecules that are not the entire virus. So this works against a lot of different RNA viruses. Um, the problem with it is it has, well, it's, it's toxic and it has to be administered in a hospital where a patient can be monitored to make sure it doesn't cause excessive liver or kidney damage. Um, we also have antibodies, monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies made in an animal. So we find a single B cell that makes great antibodies and then extract the genes from that. Um, and we can make them using biotechnology. We can make that antibody in huge amounts. And so again, that would be something we'd have to inject into a person. We also have plasmid, plasma donated by COVID survivors. And so that has polyclonal antibodies. It has antibodies from multiple B cells that all got activated at the same time, presumably. We would always expect something like five different B cells to get activated whenever we have a viral infection, just because they're, uh, they are so specific that each of them would recognize a different part of a spike protein. Um, and so these are, whoops, these are um, not available to everyone. Absolutely not available to everyone. And so uh, someone with a moderate case of COVID-19 isn't going to get these unless they are a VIP, like a president of the United States. Um, but someone with a severe case uh, in, an, in an intensive care could be given one of these. Much more common are going to be the supportive treatments um, where doctors have to look for um, the numerous different things COVID can do, like causing blood clots or respiratory distress or lots of secondary infections um, and, and excessive inflammation and keep those things under control. So lots of different supportive treatments um, are most of what uh, clinicians have to do. Um, I think that uh, this video is going to get too long. So now that I've hit treatments and prevention, I'm going to shift gears and in the next video I will talk about COVID um, outcomes and the results of a lot of different studies that have recently come out. So I'm going to te teach you some, some new things you might not have heard before um, and give you a lot of uh, numbers that people have wanted and that will be in the next video.